Welcome to another exciting episode of Scouting for Growth, the podcast where we delve into the minds of industry leaders, innovators, and change makers to uncover the secrets of their success. Today, we have a truly incredible guest joining us, Janet Linfoot, a high-performing corporate CEO turned entrepreneur with a multi-million pound business portfolio spanning multiple sectors. Janet has made a significant impact in the business world with nearly 30 years of global professional experience across the travel, leisure, hospitality, and property sectors. She has held senior roles at renowned organizations such as TUI, Thomas Cook, First Choice, and Saga, where she was the CEO of the travel division. Janet is not only a seasoned executive, but also a property investor, a board advisor, and a mentor. She has helped hundreds of business owners and senior executives elevate their careers and businesses to new heights. Her podcast, Brave, Bold, Brilliant, is in the top 1.5% of all podcasts globally and is listened to in over 120 countries. Through a podcast, Janet explores what it takes to be at the top of your game, firmly believing that everyone has the greatness they need within them. So in today's episode, we will dive into Janet's incredible journey from corporate leadership to entrepreneurship, her insights on growth strategies, merger and acquisition, and the future of work. We will definitely discuss a podcast and what it takes to thrive when working digitally and remotely while aiming to develop the right leadership skills. We will also explore a passion for diversity and inclusion and the role of personal growth and our personal development practices too. So without further ado, let's welcome Janet Linfoot to the Scouting for Growth podcast. Janet, the floor is yours. Got it. Annette, thank you for joining hey. me today. Uh, nice to see you, Sabine. How are you doing? I'm great. You know, I cannot wait to be in Amsterdam tomorrow. I'm going to be on stage for two days doing a keynote on the future of tech and innovation. And you, how are you doing? Yeah, all good. All good. All very busy my end, but good busy, you know. Yes, it has to be. (laughs) So happy to have you on the Scouting for Growth podcast. And I'm so excited to actually talk about your journey um, because I discovered you, Janet, uh, because of Saga. I have to say, because I, you know, I work in insurance and I found out you used to be a CEO as well of one of the business units at Saga. So I was really excited to welcome you on this podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for asking me to come on. And Sabine, I'm very excited that you're also going to be on my podcast, Brave Bold Brilliant. So it's a great way to collaborate, isn't it? Indeed, a wonderful way to collaborate. So let's get started with your incredible journey and uh, your transition from being, you know, the CEO of a very well-known and global company to becoming an entrepreneur. And I love that journey because I actually followed your path too. So tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm a, a Mancunian from the north of England. Um, and I grew up very working class family, you know, lots of love in the, in the uh, family. But I was the only one in the family to go to university at the time. And um, essentially, I started life as a government economist in Whitehall in terms of my professional career. And then I jumped into the travel industry where I spent pretty much 25 years Worked my way up from the bottom to the top to become the CEO of the travel division for Saga. And before that, I was the managing director of the emerging markets for TUI. So I used to buy, run, sell businesses in India, China, Brazil, 
all over the place, set to up in Russia and Ukraine with uh, three acquisitions. And um, yeah, so it's been an interesting journey. And then about 2019, I decided to jump out um, a full time corporate and essentially set up my own portfolio of businesses. So um, today I've got a property investment business with my partner, Chris, my advisory business, um, a one to one mentoring business and my podcast, Brave Bold Brilliant. So there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, that's that's it in a nutshell, really, Sabine, and lots of highs and lows along the way. And we know going into becoming an entrepreneur, there's always highs and lows. But what was a pivotal moment for you, Janet? What was the moment you said, you know what, I need to go into portfolio thinking, I need to build something different for myself? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably age and stage of life had a, a played a part to a certain degree. So probably in my mid to late 40s, I, um, you know, I just took stock really where I was. I'd loved my corporate career. I'd loved the businesses I'd ran, the teams I was privileged to lead. So it wasn't a case of not enjoying my corporate life, quite the opposite. But I just really wanted to have more freedom, choice, flexibility in uh, in my life. And my partner, Chris, he's 10 years older than me as well. Not that that matters particularly, but we just said, what does a phase of our life want to look like in the next 10, 20 years? So, you know, obviously I spent my career in the travel industry, been very privileged to travel the world. But it's one thing traveling on business. It's a bit different when you're traveling for your own enjoyment. So, yeah, by setting up and, and really having a portfolio career, it gives me much more choice around, you know, being able to travel more. And ultimately, I call the shots now, um, which is nice. So, yeah. That's why. Yeah. Calling the shots. And, you know, I don't know Chris, but tell Chris, I know Chris because I've seen Chris on your Instagram. So, hi, Chris. And <laughs> <laughs> lovely to actually see you every so often with uh, Janet on, on Instagram. But with your extensive experience, Janet, in growing businesses, growing, developing growth strategies, and, you know, I'm talking to, you know, a corporate. I work with a lot of corporate insurance companies. I work with scale-ups. I work with startups. And we always talk about build growth and scaling and today scaling is not the easiest so what for you are the key elements that businesses need to really master to actually achieve their growth path and achieve success in uncertain time because actually i read your newsletter uh, as well last night and i think we are still in an uncertain time and some companies are doing great and some company are doing less great yeah, well, I mean, listen, there's never an easy time to scale a business, you know, whether it's today or in the early 90s or in the 60s or the 70s. So I think, you know, there will always be something that's going to challenge you in business. So what I would say is, you know, really get clear on your kind of reason why. Why are you scaling up? You know, I often advise uh, the businesses that I work with, start with the end in mind and work backwards because scale is one thing, but you don't have to scale. You might decide, you know, actually you want a lifestyle business um, that gives you more freedom and choice. Or you might say, no, I really want to dominate in my space and be the market lead and maybe have an IPO or sell the business in the future. So I think you've got to, first of all, get really clear on what it is you, you want to be. What do you stand for? Um, and then to scale up, you know, I often say what has got you to the stage you're at now won't necessarily get you where you want to get to in the next phase. So starting is very different to scaling is very different to a mature business where you're maybe looking for an exit. So, you know, I think having a clear differentiated position in the market is really important when you're scaling, because otherwise you're just competing on price against your competitors. So, you know, I think to really be clear on your proposition for the customer um, and knowing where you want to take the business uh, in terms of your systems, processes, the boring stuff. Quite frankly, if they are not solid, then you're not going to be able to scale. It will fall over um, at yeah. some point. So I think, you know, it's a very good thing to kind of take a look really at your, your systems and your processes, mapping those out now, understanding where you might need to strengthen in certain areas if you are going to be building a scale business um, with much more, you know, automated processes, et cetera. 
Um, and then the third area really is um, is around the team, you know, because as as business leaders, you know, there are only 24 hours in a day. We are only one person. So your success in whichever field you're in will be very often, you know, dictated by the talent around you. Yeah. So as you're, as you're scaling your business, you may find that there are certain functions that you didn't need before, but you do need now. You mm-hmm. might find that maybe a role that was combined sales and marketing, for example, may now be of a scale where you need to separate those functions and bring extra resources into the business. So those are just a couple of areas, Sabine. But I think you've also, as a business leader, you have to believe it yourself, you know, because if you don't, it starts, it always starts with with the inner inner us, uh, regardless of what you do. So I always say with a business, it's about being brave, leading yourself, Bold, leading the business, strategy, growth, investment, raising finance, all those good things. And then the third element is brilliant, which is all about the teams and the people. So I think you need to look at all three of those areas. Um, And also don't feel you have to. Don't feel you have to scale. It might not be right for you to scale up. So just because you think maybe that's what you should be doing or what people are saying you should, you've got to really want to do it yourself because it's a really hard thing to do it's not easy so you've got to I think do some preparation before you start on that journey of growth I would say yeah I mean that is probably the only time with all the podcasts I've run that I heard you know don't scale if you don't need to scale you can have a really nice business actually in the growth stage without having hit to become you know a mega unicorn company and I think it's very wise because Most startup I work with think they have to scale. So thank you for that. But as you actually mentioning the key pillars of growth, technology, people, processes, right? Technology, people, and processes. I want to ask you about the people angle. A lot of questions that comes to me is, we have five generation in our working environments today. And the Gen Zs have a very well, very well defined and very different way of seeing the world. How do we embrace a Gen Z way of doing things in business? Because we have seen big companies not actually recently getting rid of people and management layer. They're actually, you know, letting go of the younger generation, which have never been seen before. And At the same time, this generation has very clear demands and different clear views, very clear different views as to where they want to be, how they see a business being run, and how they want to be part and contribute to that growth. What is a team element when we look at younger generations? Yeah, it's a really good point, actually. And the reality is that, you know, in any business, it's great to have a mix of talent, experience, you know, and some of that can come is age related, you know, the, the older you are, the more experience you're going to have. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. But at the same time, a younger generation coming in, you know, they've maybe got some fresh thinking and maybe a bit more energy or whatever, you know, so I think everyone contributes to a team. But I think with Gen Z, um, it's important, you know, to understand their motivations, right? Um, you know, in terms of flexibility, I think they tend to be a lot more values led, a lot more purpose led. Yeah. Um, and and they're choosing who they who they want to work with, what organizations actually, you know, they align themselves with from a moral point of view, from a values point of view. So I think, you know, to understand what, you know, the motivations of, of that generation is really important. And I think free, you know, a bit more flexibility around working environment obviously some of that has come post-covid as well right where everyone is now a bit more used to hybrid working exactly but at the same but at the same time i still believe that you know if you're ambitious and if you want to get on in your career quite frankly you've got to put the work in right so you know you're not going to get promoted you're not going to get opportunities if you take a very rigid approach and you're saying so many things about what you're not prepared to do so I think if, as a Gen Z as someone listening to this I would say okay that's great to, to have strong views and the ways you want to work but there could be a repercussion of that in terms of your career progression or speed now that might be fine you might say I don't want to progress in in, in a you know climb the corporate ladder or whatever it may be 
in which case that's fine. But let me tell you, when you're building your career, normally that means putting more effort in than you're paid to do. It means leading with value. It means volunteering for things, you know, and actually I think you have to ask yourself, how ambitious are you? Or is it that you actually do want to have more of a balance between personal life and work life? So I think it's on both sides. You have to understand. Um, but I think the energy ideas, you know, creating an environment, a work environment that's, you know, it's it's fun. It's fast paced. There's, there's opportunities for people to contribute with their ideas and creativity. You know, so all of those aspects are probably more important to Gen Z, um, I would say, in terms of who they choose to work uh, work for. Yeah, very true. I think, you know, lo looking and, and, and talking to a lot of corporation, they're still finding the right balance to welcome this younger generation and actually fulfill their needs. Now I want to move into your career in m &A. You led numerous merger and acquisitions across various markets. What do you think are the most critical factors to consider during an M&A process? And partly when we start looking at what is happening in the world today, you know, in insurance technology, which is part of fintech, insur insurtech is around 10% of fintech from an investment viewpoint. Um, so imagine fintech is around 750 billion investment to date. So insurance technology is around 75%. And what we've seen over the past two years is a lot of insurance technology, insurtechs have been acquired by big tech, but also by insurance companies, more so because of the shaky environment we are in. So tell us, why is that happening what are you looking when you do an m and and what are the critical factors that makes an m and a successful initiative? Well, it depends if you're on the buy or sell side. Okay, yes. so so let's let's touch on both because uh, I think that's important. So, if you're looking to scale your business, you can do that through organic growth using the resources, the team, you know, expanding on what you already have. You can achieve growth through organically expansion. Or you can go down an inorganic route, which often will involve either a merger or an acquisition. There is a place for both, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But in the event that you have decided that you want to go down the M&A perspective in terms of merging with another company or acquiring a company, again, I think it's it, before you start down that process, it's really important to understand by acquiring a business, what are you looking to achieve? Yeah. Is it that the business you're looking to acquire, maybe it's to take out a competitor and to, to take someone out of the market, or it might be that you want to expand into a new geographical region, a different market, and you've got an expert in the field there that can help you do that fast. It could be that you're buying a great brand or IP or a, um, a product or service that you don't currently have. So you need to understand where does it fit strategically for you because I see a lot where everyone gets very excited about the deal and then post deal they go oh my god we've got this business what do we do with it yeah. you know and that, ha that happens more than you would expect even in large corporations so first of all get really clear on how it fits I think secondly you know obviously you need to know what you're buying um, and, you know, that involves normally quite a complex due diligence process in terms of understanding the business that could be around the financial, commercial, tax, legal, HR, tech, all those areas of due diligence need to be paid attention to uh, in order for you to understand what you're buying before you buy it. Normally, you would also want to have a team of professionals around you. So that could be corporate finance. It'll be the lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the work I do when I work with private equity houses, for example, when they're looking to buy businesses, I advise them because I'm the industry person that knows what good looks like. So you might have someone like that on your team as well. Yeah. So, you, so you would have a deal team. Um, and then, of course, it's around valuation and understanding how much you're prepared to pay, looking at the forward uh, projections, so the historic financial performance, where they sit in the market, 
what's good, what's bad about this business, where's the risk, where's the opportunities, and what's the value, the projected earnings going forward. So you will know if you're paying, I know, a 10 times multiple or a 20 times multiple on EBITDA on the profit level, that basically means if that profit stayed at that same level, it will take you 10 years before you actually get a return on that investment if it stayed level. Whereas over time, if you can see a, a hockey stick of yeah. a profitability growth map, then, you know, obviously that that sort of changes things. So you've got to understand all of that and also the people in the business, you know. And then the final thing I would say is how does it fit with your existing operation? Are you going to keep the two businesses totally separate? Is the plan to integrate? And what about the post deal integration? So you need to be thinking about all of this and looking at it through either before you start the process or through that process. Um, and then of course there's negotiating the terms and, and everything that comes along with that. Um, if it's a founder led business that you're buying, yeah. you know, is the is the founder staying on? You know, will they continue in the organization? Are they on an earn out where they stay with you for a period of time? So it's very, very complex and you do need to pay attention to all of this. Um, so that's on the buy side. On the sell side, it can often be if it's a founder led business and you've grown this business from scratch. Sometimes when I work with people, they say the day they sold their business was the worst day of their life. <laughs> The worst day of their life. And you think, well, why is that? You've just, yeah, uh, you know, got X millions from, you know, all your hard work. And normally it's because they've not prepared themselves for life after having sold the their business. Entity. Yeah. The brand identity becomes, uh, dis trying yeah. to disassociate it from the company becomes really hard. Yeah. So, so if you're planning on selling your business, really think about, you know, why you're selling you know, again, what does the next phase of your life look like? You know, it might be because of cer certain situations. Maybe you were hoping to hand it on to the next generation and your kids have said, no, we don't want to take it on. We're not interested. So you want to cash out. You know, there's a whole the whole host of reasons. But I think being emotionally prepared for a sale of a business is, is really important. And of course, you have to have all this information prepared, you know, so don't underestimate the distraction that selling your business takes from the day-to-day -day operations. So I would always recommend allocating, a, it doesn't have to be a big team, it might only be one or two people, but you have some dedicated resources so it doesn't distract from the day-to-day -day operation. And then, of course, if you are selling, you would want to keep that confidential normally because you wouldn't want to you know, unsettle the team too early because the deal might not happen, et cetera. So you just need to bear all these things in mind. So it's complicated, Sabine. <laughs> There's a lot, to, a lot to think it about. It's really complicated. <laughs> And you know, the reason why I was asking you that question also is because in insurance technology, so in tech, we're you know, working with technology startups within my, my sector, within fintech insurance, what I've seen is a lot of the ventures have been sold from an acquire viewpoint. So a lot of those have been happening in recent months. And so always wondering what is a benefit and what is done with the asset. But also when you look at technology startup being acquired by big market players in the insurance industry, they don't often keep them separate. They try to integrate them. And then the asset has disappeared. Literally, you don't know what happened with it. And so, you know, I wonder what is your experience on successful acquisition of younger ventures you know is there a secret sauce to make this really driving value for the corporate yeah it's a really good really good question because i've seen it a lot through my career as well we have a, a very successful business that then is acquired by a large corporate and then they ruin the business right because the entrepreneurial spirit doesn't fit within the big machine of, mm. of a huge corporate and and often the value of what you've bought gets destroyed quite quickly in a, in a big organization so i have seen that a lot i mean again i think um in order to enhance value and not destroy value if you're buying a business because of its innovation because of its you know edgy technology or whatever it might be then you need to find a way to protect that within a larger structure so i'll give an example when i was at first choice which was one of the um large travel businesses it was number four in the market at the time i was product director and the ceo peter long he acquired a whole uh, portfolio of small specialist travel businesses. But what he did very well was he kept the integrity of those businesses. 
So they had their own brands that they'd been acquired, their own P&L, their own managing directors. Now, yes, there was a uh, there was an opportunity to optimize some back office things. But as soon as you start touching the customer facing part of that business by trying to apply a one size fits all from the big brother or the big sister of the corporate, normally that's the start of the end for those yeah. small businesses because they lose their identity. They lose their, you know, their secret source, if you like, as to why they were bought. They were bought. So but it's always this balance between optimizing the cost base versus keeping the you know the individuality um etc of the business you bought so i think it can work quite well if you have a setup where or maybe that you have an innovation lab in a large organization yep. where that business can sit um you know so i think if it gets eaten up into the big machine that's often where we see these businesses just disappearing and the value is gone yeah you mentioned identity. You mentioned, you know, keeping your street identity. I'm gradually going into, you know, a break ball brilliant. But first, I want you to, to tell us how you manage your, your portfolio of businesses and how you balance your work life, work harmony, uh, you know, how you balance everything because you have a number of businesses you are managing. You are leading teams across those different business units. How do you make it happen? How do you make sure that everybody is happy and you make yourself happy by being a work-life harmony which fits with your lifestyle? Yeah, it's a difficult one. I'm not sure that the word balance actually really exists in the way that people think it does. I think, you know, overall, if you look holistically at your life or, you know, your time, if you are managing to, you know, fulfill what you want for yourself personally, professionally, for the teams, for the business over a, a period of time, then that's balanced. But you and I know there are times in your business life or in your personal life where what you're working on demands 100 percent attention. And that therefore means that something else is not getting 100 percent. It's maybe getting zero percent at a certain time. So I think you have to look at it about being fully present and um, in the moment. So for me, I'm super disciplined with my diary, absolutely ruthless with my diary. Um, I allocate specific times of the week for certain business areas. I protect my personal well-being time fiercely. So, you know, and I'm an early bird, so I, I, I'm at my best early, but I do all my exercise, my meditation, all of that really around about 6 a.m. So that I start my day in the right way. So I'm looking after my well-being, my mental health, etc. So I think you've got to be really disciplined. You have to have the right people around you as well, mm -hmm. obviously, that you can delegate effectively to. Um, and you need to say no to things at certain times, you know, and say, is this a priority or can I do this right now? Maybe not. Thank you ever so much. But I'll come back to you in two months time when I've got some some availability. But it is difficult and I don't always get it right, Sabine. It's a constant challenge. And I think think if you're my nature is to always want to I'm ambitious I want to do more I want to deliver more I want to learn more so that's in my nature and I think if you have that in your character you will naturally push the boundaries and sometimes <laughs> you can be the one that ends up with it you know a risk of burnout so yeah I think I think having a clear structure to my day ruthless diary management having great people around that I can delegate to saying no to things that aren't a priority um, and having the you know the systems and processes that allow you to automate as much as possible where you can um those are some of the things that, that have helped me Sabine over the years but and sometimes you just have to realize that you're human and if you're re if you're reaching to the point where you know you're not sleeping you're not eating very well your energy levels are down you're not managing to fit everything you're feeling a constant state of flux then something's wrong you've got to come back and look at really how you're using using your time so yeah those are some things that i i have done but i don't i'm not perfect by any stretch i i go off the rails and i have to get myself back on track regularly you know, I will. I want to echo some of the things you you've said because I do exactly the same. I'm ruthless with my calendar, so every day is planned. I mean, my year is planned in advance. Um, conferences are planned in January. If you're not in my calendar in January, usually I would say no for any conferences which are not planned then. And um, so, you know, my calendar looks like. Uh, 
pretty much a piece of legal land, but also saying no. And I want to repeat that term. Being able to say no is critical because that allows you to create free space. And by having a really well-managed calendar, you actually are able to say no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing I'd add, Sabine, is that, you know, I um, I purposely set out to set my business up so I could run them from anywhere in the world. Yes. Right? Because my clients are international. So I'll give you an example. I was in Indonesia for four weeks in February with a client, a big client of mine, a core hotels, doing a big piece of executive board work over there um, and a big conference for them. But because we've created our business and set it up, I can run it remotely. Yeah. Um, you know, Chris was able to come with me. We added on a little bit of time so we could go and enjoy Indonesia and travel a little bit. I would be, you know, it requires a different way of working because I would have clients in America and at 13 hour time difference. So midnight, I'd be on a Zoom yeah. so I could still work with those clients. So it's a bit of a mindset shift. But I think if you set yourself up so your businesses can be run from anywhere, that's a, that's also really helpful, actually. It's good for lifestyle. And I do exactly the same. You know, during the summer, I work with my client internationally, but I spend probably most of the summer in, in Italy. Uh, for mental health, funny enough, you know, you mentioned, you know, taking care of yourself. I find Italy very good and soothing for my, my, my brain health. And I love literally writing, sitting in the garden and just writing the whole afternoon. So I want to talk about your podcast, Brave, Bold, Brilliant, and you introduced the podcast already and highlighting the pillars as to what each word mean. And I think it's very going to be very important to repeat those. 1.5% uh, globally top rated uh, podcast, congratulations. And um, you have been literally, I probably start, you started your podcast probably, I think, a year before me. Um, and you were my inspiration, Janet, when I heard you on the progressive um, section around, you know, why podcasting. And you came on and I said, OK, got it. Let's get it done. So tell us about the project, why you started it, and where are you taking it now? Yeah, no, so, so I really started it because I was being mentored by Rob Moore. So some of your people listening will know Rob Moore very well, Rob Moore and Mark Homer. So we will be mentored by those guys for our property business, but also because Rob is so great on social media, personal brand, etc., and podcasting, he really encouraged me to say, you know, Jeanette, you, you really must have a podcast. So if it hadn't been for Rob, I probably would never have started. So there's a lesson there around having the right people in your life to encourage you when you don't necessarily see these things yourself. So I was started doing more on social media because I'd come out of corporate and I was a bit more flexible because when you're in a corporate role like I was and I would be presenting, you know, to the, the analysts in the city, what you say can affect the share price. So you have to be very careful. But when I came out of corporate, I thought, well, I can be a bit more active on social media, etc. And then that gave me confidence. And then it led to me starting the podcast. Um, and the inspiration for the podcast really came from a mug that I used to have my tea in in the morning that Chris had bought me because we all I always have the I have that imposter syndrome as well and on this mug it said be bold be brave be amazing right so I'm thinking of what can the put you know the name for the podcast I knew it was going to be about growth and pushing out of your comfort zone etc but I thought we can't have amazing and even another B so we got to and I thought well brave comes before being bold so let's reorder it brave bold brilliant so that's how the name of the podcast came about but essentially how it's now evolved is um really is creating the framework and it's now become a brand in its own right. So, you know, when I work with executive teams, brave is about leading yourself, bold is about leading your business, and brilliant is about leading your teams. So a lot of the work I now do with, you know, large corporations really is around those three pillars. So obviously it's the podcast, but it's also the framework that I use for executive development, for strategy work, for mentoring. So and we've now got a new website as well, www.brave-bold-brilliant.com. So you'll find a load of resources there that are free. And if you want to work with me, then obviously you could, we can hook up there. So it's kind of 
evolved Sabine over time um we're on 410 episodes now yeah collectively. so it's um I never would have anticipated I'm that but maybe I think compared that... to you I'm at 134 so thank you for encouraging as well the younger bees to to, to follow your path <laughs> uh but that but that's a huge achievement because most people will never get past maybe 10 or 20 episodes so you know I mean huge congratulations to you as well and I love it because you get to have interesting conversations with people that are doing amazing things and then what I often find is when you get to know someone one then often they'll find what you do and then they'll you know you'll end up doing business together because you've got to know each other so it's great I, I love it 100 percent. and I've met as you said amazing people I you know I work a lot with companies in the United States in Europe as well in Asia and some of the conversation I've had actually forced me to read new books and forced me to actually look at perspective even for the ventures I work with slightly differently and create really different messages so definitely echoing but I would like to come back to your point about the framework for executive leadership if you could give three advice to the executive listening to this podcast and why being brave bold billion is actually required in the digital world we are in today what would that be so that maybe they get a bit inspired to give you a call yeah well listen i mean the first thing is it's lonely leading a business right you could be the most confident person in the world but if you're a ceo or an md or you're leading a team normally everyone's looking to you for the answers and you might not have all the answers so it's great to actually work alongside someone that understands and is able to support you through through your journey so you know the brave part of leading yourself no matter how senior you are people are people we all have our doubts insecurities fears mm -hmm. so actually being able to invest in yourself as a leader to make sure you're in the best shape that has to be the first part right of any anything we do and then the bold piece is around really the business so being clear on your strategy your five-year plan your investment case how you're going to differentiate yourself in the market market and really having a clear plan that you can then get the whole team involved with and get buy-in that's leading the business part and then the brilliant part is the teams you know because very often when we look at teams they people will say they're a high performing team and they're actually not yeah. high performance is genuine high performance you know takes hard work and you know collaboration but a winning team wins together or not at all so regardless of anyone listening if you are in a solopreneur even if you're running a huge corporate with multi-billions of pounds uh turnover and hundreds of thousands of employees the principles are the same brave leading yourself bold leading the business and brilliant leading your teams and the approach i take when i work with clients is very much i have sat in that seat of being a corporate ceo running a very large business myself internationally so i am not a management consultant in a classic sense of the word no disrespect to, to that profession because it's very important and it has a place but i find by actually having direct experience it's much much better to work with my clients because they get that structure but they also work in with someone that knows what they're talking about and is keeping it real you know and making sure yeah. that this stuff isn't just theory it's 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 implemented into the business so yeah i mean that's that for me is is a real joy to be able to help people um and step up whether you're a large corporate or you're a solopreneur the principles are the same it's interesting what you are saying, and I respect as well the management consulting um, practice and what is being done. I come from consulting, but when I talk to my client and they try to box me into, you know, a bit of a corner, I said, I'm not a management consultant. I come with expertise. And, you know, the word which has come up and up again is the word architect. So I'd rather people call me the action-driven word, like an ambassador, an activator, an architect than use a consulting world. My last question to you is, everything you do include diversity and inclusion. Can you tell us why this is important? Because I think, you know, with sustainability driver, ESG, we've lost what DEI or means and why the inclusion part of diversity is so important to build a business of tomorrow. 
Yeah, it's critical and it's something that I'm hugely passionate about. And when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, you know, it's not just about gender, it's about race, it's about social mobility, it's about culture, it's around, you know, disabilities hidden or, or, or not hidden. So, you know, it's proven that diverse teams and diverse boards achieve better results. That's a given, right? And I, I'm sick to death of having to still make the case because we shouldn't have to make the case anymore, you know. right? But unfortunately, we still do for whatever reason. So, you know, first and foremost, put your commercial hat on. If you have a diverse team, your financial results will be better in, in general, right? So because often they see businesses see it as a cost. They don't see it as a benefit. So you have to think differently. Um, but diverse range of thinking is so critical because if we have a room full of, you know, white, male, pale, stale, what you know, one, one social class, how can you represent your customer base? How yeah. can you put yourself in the customer's shoes? Your customers aren't like that, you know. So I think having a diverse, a diverse teams and a diverse pipeline of talent, which is really important because it does take time, is so important for financial performance, for actually attracting talent. You know, we we're talking about Gen Zs. You know, if you don't have a, a strong diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, you know, employees these days, they will they will vote and go and work for someone else because it's important, you know, it's it's morally the right thing to do, but financially, commercially, and for your customers and for your teams, it makes for a much more richer environment and also ultimately to be able to serve your customers better. So, you know, it's it's crucial. It drives me mad that the top 100 companies in the UK, the FTSE 100, less than 10% are, have female CEOs running them. Yeah. What the hell? This is ridiculous, you know. But <laughs> don't get me started because I get very kind of animated you about know, it. You have the same <laughs> conversation, which are not always uh, the most pleasing one, but it is about awareness. So I'm thinking as a leader in, our, you know, in the industry, somebody who has actually changed so many businesses and changed oneself as well, what would be your recommendation for my listeners uh, about how they can move things forwards. And then I want to ask you, Janet, where they can find you. Oh, of course. No problem at all. Well, I believe there's a formula for success, Sabine, right? So I'll keep it super simple. So belief plus purpose plus action equals results. So first of all, you've got to believe in yourself because if you don't, quite frankly, how else is anyone else going to? You've got to be super clear on your why, your reason why, whether that's for you personally, whether it's that for your family, your business, your customers, you've got to know why, what's getting out of bed in the morning, what do you stand for? And then you've got to take loads of action, Loads of action. Um, and that's when you get results. So if ever you feel like you're getting stuck and maybe you're not making the progress, come back to those three simple areas. Do I really believe in myself? Do I really believe in what I'm doing? Yeah. And if the answer to that is yes, great. It might be one of the other areas that's out of kilter. You know, am I clear on my purpose or, or has that got a little bit confused? Maybe I'm not as clear on what I want to achieve. Therefore, I'm getting distracted. Um, and, you know, am I taking enough action and action in the right way, focusing on the right thing? you know and being very disciplined about that so it's a really simple way just to check back in uh, with yourself and normally one of those areas has got out of kilter if you're not quite getting the results that you want so yeah absolutely that's what I would say keep it simple I like simple things that work um, and yeah belief plus purpose plus action equals results and we all have to result nowadays and so where can we find you where can what can I write in those notes <laughs> well thank you very much um sabine that's really kind of you so you can find me anywhere really on social media be it linkedin facebook instagram youtube you'll find me under jeanette linfoot which has two n's and two t's <laughs> spelt the spelt the french way of, of jeanette um and, for me. <laughs> exactly exactly um you know and then in terms of uh the website as i said www.brave-bold-brilliant.com loads of free resources there for people to you know to help them really with their their professional life and journey and um i've, I've got a youtube channel as well brave bold brilliant so that's a bit a bit newer initiative but um yeah so you can find me all over but get connected you know sign up to brave bold brilliant community because then you'll get the weekly newsletter you'll get all those free resources coming your way so yeah i'm here to help 
Thank you, Janet, for joining me on Scouting for Growth. Thank you for this amazing conversation. Looking forward to seeing you soon as well. Thank you, Sabine. Bye. <laughs>